There was once a hunter named Narcissus. He was a pretty handsome guy. One day after a bit of hunting, he grew thirsty. He then stumbled upon a pool of water. As he looked into the pool, he could see his own reflection. It was like a mirror. He stared into the pool, in love with his looks. But this fascination with himself only led to his death. He refused to leave the pool and eventually turned into a flower. Or something like that, I don't know. The term rock is dead has been around for a while, whether said by journalists, fans, or musicians. The idea that rock and roll has, well, died, has been said so much that it's pretty much been ingrained into the culture of the genre. While the idea that a hugely influential form of music like rock has died out completely is a bit ridiculous, you can't say that rock hasn't taken a backseat to hip-hop and pop. So what got us here? How did rock fall out of the spotlight? Well... Rock and roll kinda committed suicide. Rock is the reason rock died. People started looking at the genre in a different way. And sure, our perception of the genre has always changed, but this is different. A takes a cigarette, puts it in your mouth. You pull on your finger, then another finger, then a cigarette. Let's go back to the 70s, what I would consider the golden age of rock. While the 50s laid the foundation and the 60s experimented with the format, cementing it as an art form, the 70s is where rock really began consistently showing its brilliance. The Rolling Stones, Pink Floyd, Fleetwood Mac, Aerosmith, The Who, The Ramones, The Talking Heads, Black Sabbath, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, Genesis, The Eagles, Steely Dan, Supertramp. The landscape of rock was full of variety. Some bands were creating narratives and stories on their records. Other bands were pushing boundaries in terms of time signatures, song length, lyrical content, and more. But you also had people who were seemingly perfecting the three-minute rock song. Rock was also being altered visually. Bands were making a concert an experience rather than just a performance. The album cover had also changed. They were becoming pieces of art. It wasn't just a picture of the artist anymore, there was more to it. But the thing to take away is that one aspect didn't overtake the other. The music never overshadowed the art, and the art never overshadowed the music. Yet one band had a different approach. KISS is a divisive band to say the least. A really, really divisive band. They're pretty much known for their image. Fire breathing, explosions, blood, cool guitars. Not to mention they played into these characters. KISS was kind of a slave to their image. The songs were about sex, booze, and rock and roll, and while other bands also covered these themes, no band weaponized it like KISS did. They were unapologetically rock. I mean, they were the rock band in a sense. If you ask an average person what they think of rock music, I think the images of sex and partying come to mind. While it is reflective of the lifestyles of some rock stars, it started to change into the image of the music itself. Rock now had a definable appearance. And that's not a good thing, considering how different this genre is. KISS celebrated a certain reputation, and I think it would go on to harm the scene. Hey, but rock is going strong. It's not like there's any music that can really rival it. Starting sometime in the mid-70s, disco had taken over the Billboard charts thanks to its infectious grooves and fun image. It was made for dancing, and that made the genre more social than any other at the time. The movie Saturday Night Fever also brought it to prominence. Disco just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It got to a point where rock was starting to have disco elements. You had Rod Stewart, The Grateful Dead, Pink Floyd, The Kinks, and even Kiss creating disco songs. But it was more like disco-inspired rock? Like, I really can't call these true disco songs, because they're still rock and roll-ish, you know? I still get, like, the rock feel. However, rock fans weren't too happy with this change. Rock clubs and radio stations were turning into disco ones, and fans had enough. Steve Dahl of WLUP had made fun of disco for a while. He was fired from WDAI, a station which had transitioned to an all-disco format. Thus, Steve would make fun of WDAI and disco as a whole. 
He gained a following through this, which led to Disco Demolition Night on July 12, 1979 at Comiskey Park. This was a promotion held by the Chicago White Sox to get people into the park. Admission to the game was 98 cents if you brought along a disco record. The albums were then put into a giant box, which Steve Dahl would destroy between games. Around 50,000 people showed up to the game that night. To put that into perspective, there were only 44,492 seats in Comiskey Park at the time. Not to mention the average attendance at the time was a little over 16,000 people. It's because of you that this is happening tonight, okay? Not because of us. We're merely a vehicle for your thoughts. After they blow up the record, we'll be right back with an interview with Bill Gleason, the columnist, after this message. Disco sucks! Disco sucks! And we're never gonna let them forget it! They're not gonna show it down our throats! We rock and rollers will resist, and we will triumph! One, two, three, boom! Here they go! Then all hell broke loose. The event would lead to a riot and the game had to be postponed. But why did I bring this up? I think in a way this shows that rock fans were getting a bit picky. Sure, there's a bit more to it than I just don't want to hear disco, but rock fans were doubling down on the music they loved. There was this attitude that if it isn't rock, it's not worth your time. And somehow this attitude is still part of the genre. However, with rock, you were able to take chances. A band like Yes could only exist in rock. But why? Because it took a chance. Yes did something unique and rock fans gave it a try. Yes couldn't exist in the pop market because there were expectations for pop. But with rock, you could pretty much do anything. But now rock had these expectations in place. Look, I'm not saying that everything should be considered rock. But now more than ever, the labeling of the music mattered. If you didn't fit this imaginary description of what rock is, good luck. Hydrogen vent valve has been closed and flight pressurization is underway. T minus one minute, 50 seconds and counting. T minus 40 seconds and counting. The development flight instrumentation recorders are on. T minus 35 seconds. We're just a few seconds away from switching to the redundant sense sequencer. T minus 27 seconds. We have gone for redundant set sequencer start. T minus 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15, 14, 13. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. We've gone for main engine start. We have main engine start. In the same way KISS had become popular, glam metal artists like Motley Crue, Quiet Riot, Twisted Sister, Def Leppard, Bon Jovi, and more were using their image to reach mainstream appeal. This was only helped by MTV. Bands were now given a platform to promote releases, and it made their image more vital than it ever had been. It was a race to see who could put on the most hairspray, who could have the most women, or who could have the coolest video ideas. MTV brought a whole new dimension to music and bands had to capitalize on it, but I think it kind of detracted from the music. 
It's almost like the video mattered more than the song itself. Outside of glam metal though, labels were starting to think differently. The music industry started to favor simple three minute songs. Rock now had restrictions, and ultimately rock was more corporate than it ever had been. One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it, stick it out of it, sells, all right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives, you know, who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. These, the young guys are more conservative and more dangerous to the art form than the old guys with the cigars ever were. He's got his feet on the desk and he's saying, well, we can't take a chance on this because it's just simply, that's not what the kids really want and I, and I know, you know, and they got that attitude. And the day you get rid of that attitude and get back to, who knows, take a chance, you know, that, that entrepreneurial spirit where even if you don't like or understand what the record is that's coming in the door, the person who is in the executive chair may not be the final arbiter of taste of the entire population. Labels didn't want to take a risk anymore. You had to conform to be popular. When was rock ever really like that? I'd say the 50s and the early 60s, but even then, rock was just starting. By the 80s, rock had already branched out, so to see it take this step back is disappointing. Alright, look, I feel like this has all been really confusing, so let's just recap. Rock started to care more about its image and reputation than the actual music. The genre about creativity and expression became a genre about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It was just less unique. And outside of that, labels and fans were getting really picky. And it's this attitude that you still feel today. I think rock is in a pretty good spot right now. For the first time in a while, we've really been given a lot of variety. However, it's not back in the mainstream. Why? Well, I think people are stuck on the past. Don't get me wrong, I'm glad people are connecting to this old music. Hell, if it weren't for bands like Pink Floyd and the Beatles, I wouldn't be into all of this. However, I think there's a stigma around new rock music. I'd say about 99% of the mainstream rock artists right now have already been established. And maybe more than ever, these old rock legends are being celebrated. There's always someone saying they don't make music like they used to. Where's the next Led Zeppelin? Is this band the next Pink Floyd? All modern music is trash. I can scientifically prove it. Oh my god, get off your high horse. You want rock to come back and you want music to be different, but you keep celebrating the same thing. Why do you think a band like Greta Van Fleet made it big? I don't mind them, but their appeal should be obvious. They sound like a 70s rock band. And sure, they're big, but they're not really bringing back rock. I personally think if you want rock to come back, you need to embrace new ideas. You need to give new artists a chance. Because that's how rock made it big. You need to give rock another chance.